Today we're going to be looking at the examination of the cardiovascular system as seen in Terry O'Connor, but before that we just need to show the correct hand washing technique. Hey guys, today we're going to be doing a general examination of our patient Ruan Haman and we're going to move from the head to the toes and conduct all the steps in our general examination. First we start with proper hand hygiene using alcohol and then wait for it to dry. Then we uh, pr uh, proceed to greeting our patient. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Casper and I'll be doing your examination today. How are you? Fine, so Dr. Good, fine, thanks. Upon, upon examination, uh, the patient uh, appears to be very healthy with no chronic or acute illnesses um, and no signs of uh, sweaty palms or um, muscle wasting in the hands. Sir, do I have permission to examine your head today? Yes. Do you require a chaperone to be present for this examination? No, doctor. Okay, on to the examination of the eyes. First, we look at the sclera. So it is a nice pale color, so therefore we have no um, signs of jaundice. Then we look at our um, conjunctiva. Conjunctiva are a nice pale color, therefore we can rule out anemia. Now we move on to the mouth. The lips are, are, are a nice um, pinkish color, therefore we can rule out uh, central cyanosis of the, of the um, patient. Oh, please, please open your mouth, sir. Stick, stick out your tongue, please. The tongue is a nice pink color, also uh, um, counterindicative of cyanosis. And then we look at the buccal mucosa, which is a nice uh, pinkish uh, color and uh, again ruling out cyanosis and any jaundice that could be present in the patient and that's uh, rules up our examination of the head. Hi guys I'm Dr. Haynes and I will be continuing the examination from the head to toe but first the, the most important part hand washing to stop any hospital acquired infections. Hi Dr. Haynes nice to meet you. Will I, can I please examine your hand? Yes Dr. Haynes. Thank you. Looking at his hand, I see a nice uh, pale complexion of his uh, fingers, which rules out any sign of uh, peripheral cyanosis and any signs of anemia. Um, would you mind please placing your fingers um, together like this? Now, I'm checking for clubbing now. This is called the Shamroth test. If they make a nice diamond formation, then that rules out clubbing. As you can see, um, there are nice diamond formations forming between his fingers, which rules out signs of clubbing. Would you mind just checking? The other nails as well good next one perfect next one thank you very much okay so there's no signs of clubbing in this patient next i'll be checking his fingernails for any signs of splinter hemorrhages which would um which would mean that he had um, infective endocarditis but as you can see he has no signs of splinter hemorrhages so it completely rules out infective endocarditis thank you okay so now i'll be checking his uh radio pulse for the heart rate I'm going to be placing my, uh, my two fingers laterally to his uh, wrist flexion and I'm going to be checking for 30 seconds. Okay, I'm going to be checking his other, other arm to make sure that the pulse rate is equal. After checking both his pulse rates, I can um, deduce that both his pulse rates are equal and he has a pulse rate of 65 which is normal for a healthy adult of his fitness level. Now we're moving on to checking for edema. Okay, now I'll be checking his legs for any signs of edema. I'm going to start at the distal part of his tibia, pushing for 3 to 5 seconds. As I feel, right now there are no signs of any pitting edema. All the way up. Yep, no signs on this leg. Let me check this leg. Pushing for 3 to 5 seconds again, gently on the distal part of the tibia. This patient seems to be edema free. Okay, good morning. I am Kapa Gamsai and this is my patient Kyle. I have already washed my hands and the bed is already at a 45 degree angle. First of all, I'm going to inspect the chest area to see if there are any abnormalities. First of all, I will see if there are any scars or lesions. And I see no scars or lesions on the patient. Now I'll inspect for the apex bead, which is on the left side of the chest, 
it is located in the upper intercostal space, one centimeter medial to the multilobicular line. Now I'll start it with the sternal notch, and then I'll go down to find the angle of UV, and across that is the second rib, below that is the second intercostal space, below that the third rib, and below that the third intercostal space, the fourth rib, fourth intercostal space, fifth rib, and fifth intercostal space. The multiclavicular line I will find in the middle of its length. So the clavicle starts from here and ends around about there. So all of that would go down here, and one centimeter medial to that at the fifth intercostal space would be the apex bead. And I see a visible pulsation at the apex bead. The apex bead is um, defined as the most lateral and inferior point where the cardiac impulse is palpable or visible with each system. Before I start my inspection, I'd like to point out a few landmarks. Here we have our sternal notch. If we move down the sternum, we'll find the sternal angle. In line with that sternal angle is our second intercostal space. When I talk about the midclavicular line, I'm referring to the line that is formed if I had to take the clavicle halfway through the clavicle all the way down the abdomen. Today I'll be showing you how to palpate for the apex beat. So first I need to find the sternal angle to find the second intercostal space. I'll be working on the left side. Then I'm going to count down to the fifth intercostal space. So second, third, fourth, fifth. Now, from the midclavicular line, one centimeter medial, I should find the apex beat. I'll be using my palm to feel for any displacement. He has no displacement, so he has a normal apex beat. I'll now use my fingertips to palpate for the maximum impulse. And if it is normal, my fingers will be lightly lifted. He has a normal apex beat. Now I'll be palpating the heart valves for any heaves and thrills. Again, before I examine the patient, I'd like to point out a few landmarks. Here we have the sternal notch. If you move down the sternum, you'll find the sternal angle or the angle of Louis. In line with that, you have your second intercostal space. Um, when I talk about the midclavicular line, it'll be the line that is formed midway through the clavicle down the abdomen. First of all, I'll be palpating the aortic area. So from the sternal notch, I'll move down to the angle of Louis, and I'll find the second intercostal space. On the right side, it's your aortic area, so your aortic valve. And I'll be feeling palpating for any heaves and thrills. It seems normal. On the left side, in the second intercostal space, is your pulmonary area which I will be palpating again for any abnormalities. Now, if I move down on the left side to the fourth or fifth intercostal space, I will be palpating for the mitral valve, which is on the left sternal border. Again, everything feels normal. If I'm looking for the tricuspid valve, it will be in the fifth intercostal space. When I find the midclavicular line, it will be just medial. Everything feels normal. I will now be palpating over the heart, of the base of the heart, and to do that I will palpate um, using the palm of my hand over the aortic and pulmonary area. Everything feels normal. Hello, I'm Ron. I'll be doing the percussion of the cardiovascular examination, but first doing some proper and hygiene.
then moving over to the patient and asking for his permission sir would it be okay with you if i percuss in my cardiovascular system examination today yes doctor before starting the percussion i'll be identifying all the needed landmarks firstly i'll be finding the sternal notch moving down there's the angle of louis or the sternal angle and lateral to that is the second rib beneath that is the second intercostal space uh, the mid clavicular line should be uh, is in the middle of, when you look at the clavicle in the middle of the clavicle moving down on the medial to the nipple okay after identifying all the landmarks you can start a percussion angle of fluid second rib moving downwards from the midclavicular line um, we start at the in second intercostal space we're going to move down um, and check every intercostal space uh, it will sound resonant until we find dullness which will be the heart border so second third fourth this will resemble the heart so after finding the heart border i'll be percussing from the mid auxiliary line towards the sternum to find the left heart border so this is where the sound was dull cussing from the mid auxiliary line moving inward dullness is found here this represents the left heart border. Identify three landmarks for the auscultation. The first landmark is the sternal notch, which is over here. And then just below that, you'll find the sternal angle. And then the midclavicular line you will get by looking at the length of the clavicle and finding the middle of that. And you follow that point right down. That's your midclavicular line. Thank you. And I'm going to be auscultating and looking for landmarks on Kyle, the patient. Um, we measure that the bed is 45 degree angle and um, Kyle, are you, are you comfortable? The patient is also comfortable and now I'm going to look for the mitral area. The mitral area is situated at the 4th or 5th intercostal space um, medial to the midclavicular line. So we'll start with the sternal notch and then the sternal angle, go across and look for the fourth of the intercostal space. So we have the second rib. This is the second intercostal space. Third rib, third intercostal space. Fourth rib, fourth intercostal space. Fifth rib, and the fifth intercostal space. And we're looking for the midclavicular line, which is the halfway of the clavicle, situated over here. So this is the part where we're going to ask for that for the mitral area. Okay, so I'm first going to be auscultating with the bowel part of the stethoscope. And I can hear the epic speed. Next, I'm going to be using the diaphragm, so I'm going to be switching it around and testing. It's working. And I can hear the epic speed as well. Next, I'm going to be looking for the tricuspid area, which is situated at the 4th or 5th intercostal space on the left sternal border. So we go from the sternal notch, sternal angle, and then the second rib, second intercostal space, third rib, third intercostal space, fourth rib, and the fourth intercostal space, and the fifth rib, and the fourth intercostal space, and then the last one. Second intercostal space, left sternal border. And I'm going to be asked all day. I could hear the 
tricuspid area. We identify the aortic uh, area which is situated at, at the second intervascular space right sternal border. Which is located over here, and I'm going to tell us what that is. And I could hear the heart sound. Is the or the first heart sound is the it signifies the closure of the tricuspid and mitral valves. It's best heard over the mitral area using the bowel diaphragm. And also, it also signifies the start of systole or ventricular contraction. Uh, S1 also coincides with the pulse, so I'm going to be checking Carl's radial pulse. And I can feel that it coincides with the S1. The second heart sound is pasted over the aortic area and signifies the closure of the aortic and pulmonary valves. Yeah. It still also uh, signifies the closure of the aortic and pulmonary valves and also signifies the end of systole and ventricular relaxation. Venous pressure is the pressure observed over the venous system via visualizing the internal jugular vein. It is used to differentiate between different heart diseases. With the jugular venous pressure, you have to look at the clavicles, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and the internal and external jugular vein. To go about measuring with the JVP is the column of blood that runs up the external jugular vein. And what the column of blood is used for is to confirm the function of the right atrium or rather the right heart. A healthy JVP is between the ranges of 3 to 4 centimeters in vertical height from, measured from the sternal angle. And anything above or below this needs further investigation. I'm Dr. Grobelaar and I will be examining the JVP on our patient, Ms. Groen. I position her body in a 45 degree angle. Her neck is in a central position and the lining is perfect. May I please examine your JVP, Ms. Groen? Yes. My first step is identifying the landmarks to measure the JVP. We start with a suprasternal notch and then we have the clavicle. Ms. Groen, will you please face left? And this is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It has a head in the sternum and a head in the clavicle where it is attached. The two heads form a miniature triangle above the proximal head of the clavicle and this is where we will check for the JVP. To check for the JVP, we use two rulers. One we will place on the hook of Louis. To get to the hook of Louis, we start at the suprasternal notch, go down the manubrium and palpate for the hook of Louis. Place one ruler there vertically. Then we take the other ruler and palpate for the internal jugular pulse that, that is where we will place the second ruler horizontally and we will measure our JVP. Mrs. Groen's JVP is 3.7 and is within the normal range. Thank you.